so today we want to focus on uh, Revelation chapter 5, which gives us a, a detailed record of the scroll, the scroll with the seven seals. We find that uh, the book of Revelation is very, very specific in the way it is constructed. It wasn't put together by accident. It wasn't put together on a whim or a fancy. Every detail is uh, so very, very important. Revelation chapter 1 is full of foundational information that we need to understand the following chapters. Revelation chapter 2 and chapter 3 is particularly a message to seven congregations. Once you are called out of this world to live a holy, a godly, and a righteous life before the living God. And so that's chapters 2 and chapter 3. In chapter 4, we need to understand the importance of this chapter. It's about what I would call the throne room in heaven, which is probably not a very good description. But there we are introduced to uh, beings and uh, things that are going to go right through the rest of the book of Revelation. They're going to be rep referred to again and again and again. So you follow there's a logic and a sequence to everything we've seen so far. And now the attention is drawn to the scroll. And um, I did uh, just uh, start in on this a few days ago, so the first few uh, slides, I'm not going to spend too much time there, um, but I just want to catch you up. So we'll go to slide, uh, the next slide now, please. Okay, um, we need to answer these questions. When was the scroll written? We're not told specifically and instantly. We have to go and research certain things. Who were the authors? Or the author? Who was the author or who were the authors? What's in there? And why couldn't it be opened before this point of time? These are all relevant and significant to what's going to follow. If we want to get our sequences right, we need to address these questions. And who was the only one in this chapter we find who was able to open the scroll? And then the question is, why? So verse 1 there at the bottom of the slide says, Then I saw a scroll in the right hand of the one who was sitting on the throne. There was writing on the inside and the outside of the scroll, and it was sealed with seven seals. So we're going to have a look at this. Now, in previous uh, studies, uh, I've suggested to you that this might be a marriage contract. I haven't forgotten that, but we're moving forward with our information. And when we look at this, um, I'd like us to also consider... Uh, these questions in a little bit more detail uh, now. Um, first of all, what does the scroll contain? Well, what have we been told? First of all, um, the inside of the scroll would have had all the details of the subject matter. Whatever that subject matter is, it's all on the inside. But on the outside, and we're told that it was written on the inside and the outside, the outside probably had a summary of contents. So at one glance, people could say, that's that scroll. That contains this. But they weren't allowed to break the seals. Okay. Um, why seven seals? Now, this is very interesting. In a, a Jewish uh, marriage context, um, the, uh, seal, the, there were seven signatories to the marriage contract. Okay. We won't go into that right at this moment. And so it could be a marriage contract. But also we just dis dis discover that the seals are there so people can't alter or tamper with the contents. And we have a lot of problems in our world today with people who change the number in your bank account or, uh, and it changes the value of the money you've got and whatever. And people tamper with all sorts of things. We just had one recently with some very well uh, uh, reputed uh, accounting company where somebody fudged with the numbers. Um, and at the time of John's writing, we understand that the Romans required any legal document pertaining to life and death. If there was some document that related to a person's life or death, then it had to have seven separate seals on that document securing its contents. Why would Satan be comfortable if he was the one involved in this uh, scroll? 
uh, why would he be comfortable leaving it in God's hands? And I'm going to suggest to you, I'll, I'll go into this in more detail later, um, that if, um, if Satan was involved in this, this scroll at some stage in its formulation, why would he leave it with God? Well, I'll give you a very simple answer. If he left it in God's care and God broke the seals or fudged what was going on inside, he would have lost his godhood. He would have breached his divinity, his integrity, his moral character would have become like Satan. So Satan would be quite safe in leaving that in heaven because heaven is full of righteousness and honor and integrity. And so I'll just throw that out as we look. Now, um, in Hebrew, seven is the number of completeness. So we're being told that the contents of the scroll are completely secure with the seven seals. Does that make sense? I hope so. So why is this document so important? Well, let's think about what we've been told. First, it came from God's right hand, so it has to be extremely valuable. You know that uh, the right hand signifies greater authority than the left hand. And so it was in God's right hand. It was an extremely valuable document for God to be concerned about it. God isn't concerned about uh, a story written about Heidi or um, some individual member of society, Biggles faces certain death or something, whatever the book's called, God's not going to hold it in his right hand. It has to be a really valuable document for him to have it in his hand. And it came from God's right hand. How do I know it came from God's right hand? The answer is because we know that the Lord Jesus Christ sits on that throne, but now we discover that he's the one who receives the scroll. It can't be in his hand if he's going to receive it, which we read in the later verses. And so we see that the scroll is of great significance because God the Father had it in his hand. And for anything to be in God the Father's hand, it had to be important, very important. And of course, all of this was in heaven. We might move to the next slide, please. Now, I did answer these questions for those who were here a few days ago, but I'm just going to rush through them again. Um, why a strong angel? Why did, it, why did the angel have to shout? What was his challenge? Let's move to the next slide. Uh, we've got, seems to have a bit missing off the bottom. Oh, no, that's all right. This one here's got it. Okay, that's fine. Um, why a strong angel? And I'm going to answer these questions. First of all, this was an important member of the heavenly staff. He, this angel had authority to, to shout out what he had to say, and he had authority because he was himself a very, very powerful angel. And so it was something of great value that might have needed defending. The same scroll we're talking about. And there is a prospect that this scroll could be lost by theft. You follow? So there's a... God does everything for a reason, but we're told all of this stuff. A quick glance through the book of Revelation, we will never notice it. Why did he have to shout? Well, what he had to say was very, very important. You note all the way through the book of Revelation, when there's a trumpet call or an angel speaks with a trumpet voice or a voice like a trumpet, it's an important declaration. And the whole human race should look up and realize that God is saying something to all of humanity. And we know that humanity often pays absolutely no attention to God whatsoever, but at their peril. And so we know that this angel shouted so that nobody could miss the call. Their shouts and calls from heaven to earth today. And we make a quick casual comment in the news and pass on as if God had nothing to do with it. I'm talking about things like earthquakes and floods. There's just been floods in, in Britain and everybody's going on like a pork chop because the ocean rose about 18 inches. What's that? Um, 
uh, what's it, that m millimeters? So, somebody said the right amount, okay. And now they're going on at the ocean and England went up that far for a flood, you know? Um, but did they think that maybe God was telling them that times are changing? Oh, no, no, no. God's not there. The God only comes into the weather patterns if you've got insurance. And the insurance company doesn't want to pay for an act of God. But even in our insurance, we're told that a lightning strike is an act of God. But then we divorce that lightning strike from God and say, no, God doesn't exist. Not very sensible, is it? And th this shout... It's like, I don't know if you played hard and seeker in your child, but we would all count off um, uh, and not looking. And then, then we would yell, 97, 98, 99, 100, coming ready or not? And this is what the trumpet sounds are about in the book of Revelation. God is coming ready or not. He's coming. So what was the angel's challenge? The angel tells us so much. He says, who is worthy? Now you can go to the Buddha. He wasn't worthy. He never claimed to be worthy. You can go to Confucius. He's not worthy. You can go to Muhammad. He never said he was worthy. But when you turn to Jesus Christ, you hear time and again, worthy is the Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world. Was that not what John the Baptist said? So, that was the first question. Secondly, this angel indicates that there are specific qualifications for the person who can open the scroll. There must be qualifications. Who is it who's qualified? Then, who has the right? Who has the authority? And these are all things that are necessary. And then never before... Had this been possible in all history since the fall of Adam, Adam and Eve? Up until this moment in time in history, nobody could open that scroll because they did not satisfy the conditions, the criteria. And so we need to understand that when the scroll is opened, it's a very important, a very significant time in all history. The time has come. We are, are not given a clear time time frame at this stage but the time has come and as we see this we see that John is profoundly touched and moved by what's happening in this vision he's having we might move to the next slide now please and um, in this slide we're looking at Revelation 5 verse 3 it says but no one in heaven or on earth or under the earth was able to open the scroll and read it Nobody qualified at this moment. And so this is the journey that John is traveling as he's having this vision. Now, I did mention in a lecture or two back the question whether the scroll was a marriage covenant or if it was a book of life. And uh, you can read the details on the uh, slide in front of you. But I'd like to take you back to Nehemiah ch chapter 9, and uh, just read a little verse out of the life of the history of Israel when the people were presented the law of the Lord. And they s responded, in view of all this, we are making a solemn promise and putting it in writing on the sealed documents of the names of our leaders and Levites and priests. The document was ratified and sealed with the following names. And so it goes on. You see, there's a, a principle set in the Old Testament of putting stuff down in a written document and legally signing it so that it is unchanging. It's a pledge. It's a commitment. And so we need to understand whether this is a marriage covenant or if this is the book of life or if it's something else. There are parties to it who are witness to it and say, yes, they sign to it. They put their seal of approval and security on it. We might move to the next slide now. Revelation 5 verse 4, Then I began to weep bitterly, because no one was found worthy to open the scroll and read it. Well, hopefully you've already read the next chapters in the book of Revelation, so you've got an inkling of what might happen. 
But here we see that John is profoundly impacted by the vision he's living in. It's real to him. It's alive to him. Um, he's, he's, he's going through every motion and experience along the way because it's important. Now, um, in John chapter 20, verse 17, Jesus has just risen from the dead. And Jesus says to Mary, he says, Don't cling to me, for I haven't yet ascended to Father, but go find my brothers and tell them, I, will, I am ascending to my Father and your Father, to my God and your God. This is a profound moment in the journey of the human species. Jesus had died on the cross of Calvary. Now he was risen from the dead. And when these ladies come to him and see him, the first thing they want to do, they want to reach out and touch him. He said, no, 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 no. Because Jesus is absolutely following the law, the Mosaic law, to the letter. And he knows that if he is to be appointed and anointed the great high priest, he cannot be soiled or dirtied in certain ways. And I won't go into that today, but to suffice to say, this is the moment that's happening. And Jesus said to the ladies, don't touch me. But later, he says to doubting Thomas, come put your finger in the hole in my hands. Put your fist up into to my side. So we see that at one moment this is not allowed, another moment it is allowed. So some transition was taking place. But John, the apostle, of course, in this vision, is not aware of all the outcomes. He's traveling a journey like you and me. In Psalm 110 verse 4, we read, You are a priest forever in the order of Melchizedek. I don't have time to go into that today. But Melchizedek had no ancestry. He had no parents. He didn't have relatives. He's just a priest out of time. And many scholars believe that he was Jesus', his, Jesus pre-incarnate was Melchizedek. And, and Hebrews 7, you need to read Hebrews 7 and, and chapter 8. We see that Jesus is our more excellent high priest with a greater covenant than the law of Moses. So John wept bitterly, copiously. And I would like to ask you today, do you have a tear for those who are going to hell? Do you care? And if you care, what do you do about that? Well, the first thing we need to do is to be men and women of prayer. We need to pray for the lost. My wife and I, we spend copious hours praying for our relatives, the members of this congregation, because our hearts cry is that every last one of you and every last one of them will find their ways into the portals of glory. John wept bitterly, copiously, heartbreakingly. And then we read in the next verse, Revelation 5, we'll move to the next slide. But one of the 24 elders said to me, stop weeping. In other words, in the Aussie sense of wake up to yourself. And the reason is because that elder knows what's coming. And John doesn't. With all of his theology at this moment, John does not know what's coming. He says, stop weeping. Look, the lion of the tribe of Judah, the heir to David's throne, has won the victory. He is worthy to open the scroll and its seven seals. Do you see you've got such a dilemma one moment and you've got such a simple answer the other. We need to understand that in A.D. 15, there was no savior of the world. In A.D. 25, there was no savior of the world. Only when Jesus had gone to the cross, died for our sins, and risen from the dead to prove it, was there a salvation for any man on the planet. John had seen and heard the challenge. Is there anyone worthy? Is, can anyone be found? He feels this despair. Then these elders, we discover are persons of compassion. They're just not, auto, auto, what do you call it? Automatons, uh, computers, robots. They're not. 
They're living, feeling beings, and I believe they were human beings. And the focus is drawn to the Lord Jesus Christ. The book of Revelation is the revealing of the Lord Jesus Christ, and here it is again and again. So, what does he say? He says, he is called the Lion of the tribe of Judah. How many people fit that description? Only one. He's called the heir to David's throne. How many people fit that description? Only one. He is called the victor, and the victory has been won. Who is the great victor? Only the Lord Jesus Christ. And uh, he has a victory over the heavens, the heavenlies that affects all men on earth. No wonder this angel was happy. And I can just imagine John, his emotions have gone up to such a crescendo, and now suddenly his understanding dawns on him, it's okay. And you know, you and me, most all of us have done some pretty unkind things in the journey of our life. Things that we have repented of, we've regretted, we say, oh, I wished I'd never done that. Whether it was something about sexual immorality or something about honesty, we stole somebody's money or their credit or whatever it is, um, uh, all of these things can go through the rest of our lives plaguing us because God gave every last one of us a conscience and that conscience works and it tells us that we need a saviour. And without Jesus Christ, the Buddha can't save us. Muhammad can't save us. Muslims have no confidence of what's going to happen to them when they get to eternity. They just don't know. But we know and we know because it's Jesus who went to the cross for our sin. Now we move to the next slide. And uh, I'm going to read Revelation 5 verse 6 to you. Then I saw a lamb that looked as if it had been slaughtered. But it was now standing between the throne and the four living beings and among the 24 elders. He had seven horns and seven eyes which represent the seven false spirit of God that is set out into every part of the earth. What a strange description. A lamb that looked like it had been slaughtered, but it's standing upright. When you slaughter a lamb, it's going to be eaten. It's going to be cooked. There's going to be nothing left. And we go back to the children of Israel leaving Egypt and the covenant that they had, and they had a lamb for a household which is why I repeatedly tell you, you need to be committed to a church. You need to be in the household of God. And that church needs to preach the blood of Jesus Christ. And the blood was on the doorposts and the lintels. And everybody for that night of Passover was not to leave. Now, you might have been excused 100 years ago if you didn't commit to a church. But at the return of Jesus Christ, you're either in or you're out. This is the day of decision. You need to be in the family of God or you need to recognize that you're not. If you're not committed to a body of believers, then you're not in. And you need the door shut while you're in. And we see that again in the life of uh, Rahab in uh, Jericho when Israel came there, just so graphically portrayed. Um, now, let's just have a, a look at what we've seen here. First of all, seven horns. Well, we also know from Bible prophecy, and remember, the book of Revelation was written to be simply understood by ordinary Jewish believers and Gentile believers alongside of them who would be being taught by the Jewish believers what all the traditions and such like meant. So, with our previous knowledge, we should understand that the seven horns represent um, political come military power, complete military come political power because there were seven horns. Do you understand that? We're talking about the lamb. Secondly, he had seven eyes. What does that mean? One, two, three, four. No, no, no. He wasn't a spider. No. It means a completeness of insight to all dimensions that ever exist. He is the all-knowing God. He's being described as... And the Jewish people would have known this just at a Click of their fingers, I got it. Us, we've got to work at it. Okay. And then it says, which represented the sevenfold spirit of God. 
Didn't we talk about that in lecture one, I think it was? That the seven, false, seven spirits of God could be the sevenfold spirit of God or seven aspects of the spirit of God or in other words, the completeness of the Holy Spirit. And here we have confirmation yet again. Now Matthew 28 <clears throat> and 20. Um, the sevenfold spirit of God is the third person of the Trinity as well. And we saw that in Revelation chapter 1. And this is, this is sent to every part of the earth. And I would remind you that when Jesus comes back, the Bible says every eye shall see him. So how that quite works, I don't, don't know, but I do know that television uh, has brought that into the world of possibility for our thinking. Imagine reading this 100 years ago when there were no motor cars. Or should I say 150 years ago, there were motor, motor cars and whatever. And there's no radio, wireless, no TV, no telephone. All those things didn't exist 150 years ago. But we've got those advantages now. Matthew 28 verse 20 says, Teach these new disciples to obey all the commands I've given you, and be sure of this, I am with you always, even to the end of the age. Jesus said, where two or three are gathered in my name, there I am in the midst of them. Jesus is here today. Now let's just take a note of the elders for a moment. The four-headed beings and the four throne in the th and the throne are in different locations in this portrayal. Remember, we looked at the throne room of God before. Now these beings are in slightly different spaces and places in chapter 5, which tells you that we're taking, remember I said it before, snapshots, prints. This is not a, a moving video that John can describe. He can only describe snapshots. He can't describe the whole video that we would see if we went to YouTube today. So let's, uh, uh, let's go to the next uh, 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 slide. That looks like that's the right one. Verse 7, the lamb stepped forward and took the scroll from the right hand of the one sitting on the throne. Here we see the whole trinity. We have just seen the sevenfold spirit of God, the verse before. Here we see the Father, God the Father, sitting on the throne, handing to the Lamb the scroll. So there's the Holy Spirit, there's the Father, and there's the Son. Don't tell me that the Holy Spirit is not God. He is there in all his glory. But as per always... There's not much said about him or credit given to him for whatever reason. Now the lamb stepped forward. Remember a moment ago John was in tears. He's weeping copious tears because there's no, no one who qualifies. And Jesus said, I qualify. Muhammad never said, I qualify. But Jesus said he qualified. No one else dared step forward. There were no other contenders. No one else had any right. It was Jesus or no one at all. The Bible says, Neither is his salvation in any other, for there is none other name under heaven given among men whereby we must be saved. That's an imperative. Go to any other religion, they cannot compare. There is only one Savior. You will not get to heaven through Hinduism. It just won't happen. It can only happen through Jesus Christ. Now, the Lamb took the scroll. Is John witnessing a past event? Or is he the human witness to the factual event unfolding in AD 96? I think that John is a witness to the actual event. You know, um, if somebody wins, say, an Olympic race or whatever it is, do they get their medal instantly they uh, get to the end of the pool? No. They set up a ceremony, and that's when they get their reward. Okay. Um, if somebody buys a house, 
Do they get it the moment they sign the, 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 the deeds? No. There's a waiting period while all the legals are done, whatever those are, and then maybe a month or six weeks or whatever it is later, they get the title deeds. Well, they don't even get that in Australia. They just get permission to move in. Okay. What I'm trying to say to you is that all of this was completed around about AD 30 on the cross of Calvary and when the tomb was broken open. Everything was fulfilled. But here's the ceremony. Do you understand what I'm saying? Do you understand why just a few years later, now is the time? Okay. Now, so I'm, now what we see here is, I've touched this already, that God the Father from his right hand hands to his son Jesus the scroll, the hand of authority and power of the one sitting on the throne. God the Father is introduced so simply and so unobtrusively into the journey of the book of Revelation. See that? He's not even named. He's just there, and he can't be Jesus. Now Psalm 2 verse 7 says, The king proclaims the Lord's decree. The Lord said to me, You are my son, Today I have become your father. And that's repeated in the Gospels. Matthew 26, verse 64. Jesus before the council said, Now wasn't this a beauty? You have said it. And in the future you will see the Son of Man seated in the place of power at God's right hand and coming on the clouds of heaven. Jesus always declared the truth. He's in front of the Sanhedrin. He's in front of of the high priest of that year, and he says, you want to know who I am? Now I'm telling you outright, I am going, and in the future, you will see me seated at the right hand of the Father, which you read in Revelation chapter 4 and chapter 5. Can you say amen? Isn't that so amazing? Now, while he was doing that, the high priest tore his garments, and if you go and read in the Old Testament, that disbarred him from being the high priest. That was a sin he just committed. And he is going to condemn the King of Kings and the Lord of Lords to death, to a cruel death while he's a sinner. Isn't that so precious? Hebrews 5 verse 5. This is, that is why Christ did not honor himself by assuming he could become high priest. No, he was chosen by God who said to him, You are my son today. I have become your father. What a profound encounter with the living God we can have as we go through the pages of the book of uh, Revelation. I want to quote you Acts chapter 13, verse 33, 37. Sorry, it's a few verses, but bear with me. As it is written in the second psalm, You are my son, today I have become your father. God raised him up from the dead so that he will never be subject to decay. As God has said, I will give you the holy and sure blessings promised to David. So it is also stated elsewhere, you will not let your holy one see decay. Jesus was not in the grave long enough for his body to see decay. Now when David had served God's purpose in his own generation, he fell asleep. He was buried with his ancestors and his body decayed. But the one whom God raised from the dead did not see decay. So we're looking at Jesus, and we're looking at Jesus, and we're looking at Jesus again and again and again. Not only Jesus, but we also see God the Father. We also see God the Son, uh, the Holy Spirit. Now, I want to move to a little bit of a more difficult uh, spot now in verse 8 of Revelation 5. And this is what it says. He, when he took the scroll, the four living beings and the 24 elders fell down before the Lamb. Why? Just in humble gratitude that he could do what he's about to do. Each one had a harp, and they held gold bowls filled with incense, which are the prayers of God's people. Now we're being introduced to more details, more information, more evidence. What does it say? Well, we didn't know this about those 24 elders before, but now we see that each of them has a harp. Now we've already discovered in our previous lectures that these elders were very like the human beings. We've already sort of settled that that might be the case. And now we see that they've got harps. Well, 
What does a harp represent? What did King David play? He played a harp as he sang his praises and worship to God. And so we see these 24 elders have got an extra characteristic here. They must be worshippers. They must be musicians. They must be worship leaders in the choirs of heaven or certainly in the choirs of men on earth. And then we see that each elder has a golden bowl. What does gold represent? It represents the essence of the nature of God. So when we look at these bowls, we're being told there's some divinity here. And then we have to ask the question, what's in the bowls? We're told that the bowls are filled with incense. We think about that and we look back to the tabernacle of God in the Old Testament, and we say, oh, yes. Oh, got a phone call coming in, can't take it. And I forgot to put this on silent. There we go, sorry about that. Um, in the tabernacle, they used to burn incense continuously, and it was made very, very uniquely for the temple. There's only one type of incense that was accepted to God, and uh, was it Nadab and Abihu or somebody, they decided to do their own thing, and they lost their lives. So this was important to God. And here, we suddenly revealed a whole new thing about this. What is this new thing? It is that the incense represents the prayers of the believers. Each golden bowl is telling you and telling me that our prayers are important to God. He, he couches them in a golden bowl because he identifies them as representing something of the essence of himself. Prayers of compassion. Prayers for souls to get saved. Prayers for people to be healed are so important to God that he, he doesn't let them go. Now, Exodus 30, verse 34 to 38, I won't, I won't go through that uh, by details, but that's how they tell you how to make the incense acceptable to God. And then, uh, whatever, and then it, 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 just down towards the end, God says, you must treat this incense as most holy. You must treat your prayer life as most holy. Do we spend time with God in prayer? I know. I need to spend more time with Him. Never use this formula to make this incense for yourselves. You don't pray to yourself. You don't pray to any other God. You pray to the living God. And you must treat it as holy. Anyone who makes incense like this for personal use will be cut off from the God's community. The golden bowl filled with the incense is the prayers of the saints. Now, it doesn't matter whether you're in Iraq, if you belong to the Coptic Church, the Egyptian Church, that's older than the Roman Catholic Church. It doesn't matter if you're in some modern-day translation, denomination like Methodist or Baptist or Calathampian. If your heart's right, God will receive your prayer. You say amen? Psalm 56, verse 8, it says this, You keep track of all my sorrows. You have collected all my tears in your bottle. You have recorded each one in your book. You know, the times that we've been so brokenhearted in our lives, we don't know which way is up. We don't know where to turn. We turn in desperation to the Lord. And he not only acknowledges and answers our prayers, but he holds all of that as a treasure in his heart. He says, you have collected all my tears in your bottle. Every sorrow has got value. We see the progressive revelation of Jesus Christ, the seven congregations, the Holy Spirit. We see angels everywhere. We see the resurrected Christ. Then we see God the Father. We see the Holy Spirit. And now the saints through their prayers and their worship. You see God is building layer upon layer upon layer upon layer of relationship between him and the repentant sinner, me, you. 
Have we got that slide up? Let's put that slide up now, please. I'm just going to go to um, uh, uh, Revelation uh, 5, verses 9 to 10, just while you have a glance at that. Um, and I'll read it out to you. It says, and they sang a new song. Remember, they, we've just been introduced to their harps, eh? And it says, and they sang a new song with these words. And they're singing to Jesus. He says, they sing, you are worthy to take the scroll and break its seals and open it. For you were slaughtered, and your blood has ransomed people for God from every tribe and language and people and nation. Now, when we get to chapter 7, I want you to remember this verse. Okay? And you have caused them to become a kingdom of priests for our God, and they will reign on the earth. I want to remind you of Matthew Six, where we have what we call the Lord's Prayer. And how do we start? Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth, exactly like it is in heaven. When Jesus' disciples asked him to teach them to pray, he said, pray for the kingdom of God to rule on earth exactly as it is in heaven. We are coming to this transition in the history of the humankind. It's such an important time. And so we see the whole world is now rejoicing that men can at last be redeemed from their sin. We have a detailed statement of what Jesus can do. He can open all the seals. Okay, this salvation encompasses every tribe and every people group. Jesus said in Matthew 24, that these things would not happen until the gospel was preached to all people groups in the world. Today, that is a truth. Now, they may not have someone individually coming to them and say, would you give your life to Jesus? But they've got it on the airwaves. They've, the, if you go to India, they've got a PA system. They preach the gospel with uh, speakers up full volume, so everyone uh, hundreds of meters around can hear. And uh, I had the joy of seeing a... Um, uh, a lady wonderfully converted while she's sitting in her home um, when I was preaching at a revival crusade. Um, and here we see um, that all over the world, people have listened to radio, they've listened to television, there's uh, many churches in many parts of the world, and it's on YouTube. China can't keep this out. The gospel is there everywhere. And Luke 15 verse 7 says, In the same way, there is more joy in heaven over one lost sinner who repents and returns to God than over 99 others who are righteous and haven't strayed away. See, this has got to be part of our lives. Prayer is so important, and sharing our faith is something right next to God's heart. This song tells us what we will become. It says, there it is, And you have caused them to, be, to become a kingdom of priests for our God, and they will reign on the earth. Can you say amen to that? Uh, let's move to the next slide there. Um, we're nearly uh, at an end now, but these are very, very important things. Can you see this? This chapter of Revelation is a very vital and critical chapter in understanding everything else. Revelation 5 verse 11 through 14 says, Then I looked again, and I heard the voice of thousands and millions of angels around the throne, and the living beings and the elders. Everybody's being included in this. And they sang in a mighty chorus, Worthy is the Lamb who was slaughtered to receive power and riches and wisdom and strength and honor and glory and blessing. And then I heard every creature, hear this, I heard every creature in heaven and on the earth, and under the earth, and in the sea. So all the miners, all the coal miners, underneath Lake Macquarie, or wherever it is, he's reaching everywhere. They say, blessing and honor and glory and power belong to the one sitting on the throne, and the Lamb forever and ever. And the four living beings said, Amen. And the 24 elders fell down and worshipped the Lamb. Let's move to the next slide. <coughs> As I look at these verses, I just ask the question, is there anybody else?
can we expand this number any bigger? It seems to me that the whole of heaven, the whole of heaven is rejoicing in this moment. This moment when the seven seals are about to be broken and we're going to get access to the contents of that document. And then I ask, does this include our guardian angels? And if we each have two guardian angels, as some people believe, and there are eight billion people on planet Earth, then how many guardian angels must there be? At least 16 billion. So they're all included in this number. Can we comprehend the magnificence of what we are reading? This description is amazing. The seals are not yet broken, but there's rejoicing in heaven. The Bible says over one sinner who comes to repentance. Can you imagine what this moment is? I don't know that I can do it justice. But let's read Philippians chapter 2 and verse 6. It says, Though he was God, he did not think of equality with God as something to cling to. Instead, he gave up his divine privileges. He took the humble position of a slave and was born as a human being. When he appeared in human form, he humbled himself in obedience to God and died a criminal's death on a cross. Therefore, God elevated him to the place of place of highest honor and gave him the name above all other names that at the name of Jesus every knee should bow in heaven and on earth and under the earth and every tongue declare that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of God the Father doesn't that just touch your heart this is the living God <coughs> giving credit to his son for what he has done for the whole of humanity and the whole of eternity and the whole of heaven. I cannot but say thank you, Jesus, that somehow or other you saw fit to save my life and to give me the gift of eternal life. But I'll tell you what, I'm hanging on to that for all I'm worth. I'm a rat bag, you know it and I know it, but he's my redeemer, he's my saviour, he's my Lord, he's my master and I love him to bits. I love him with every part of my being and I want to give him all the praise and all the honor and all the glory. Let's uh, close in prayer. Oh God. Revelation chapter 5 is such a vital, vital chapter. It tells us a lot about the seven sealed scroll and how important it is in heaven. It also tells us about the, the Savior, the Lord Jesus Christ. And oh God, how could you let your son go to such a cruel, such a vicious death to satisfy your standard of justice and integrity that I could be saved? Oh Lord, I'm so glad you did. It's beyond my capacity to comprehend that level of love. And I pray, Lord, for each and every person who uh, has heard this message today or hear it online in due course, that your love for them would be so evident to them. They have to turn from their sin. They have to surrender to your lordship. But you will create your life inside of each and every one if they just cry out to you from the depths of their heart. We pray your blessing and your favor on each and every one of us now. In Jesus' name, amen.